Welcome in, everyone. Another edition of Ohio State Buckeyes Live, number 89. And what a stellar report card for these guys in terms of attendance. Kevin Noon, Buckeye Grove from Rivals. Tony Gerdeman there in the middle from Buckeye Scoop. And, of course, Steve Hellwagon at 247 Sports. Buck Nuts. Gentlemen, how are we doing today? Good afternoon. Pretty good. Doing well. So Steve kind of ushered us in last week with a – uh, a launch to the off season in the doldrums of January and February and a long off season into the, um, into the abyss before we can look forward to some semblance of college football and springtime weather and all those things. So it, it's good to see everybody's a little bit more chipper this week. Feeling better this week, Steve? We're trying. I don't know. Right. We're a week, week closer to the season, so that's good. But uh, I don't know. Long way to go. I mentioned to somebody that I was on the phone with uh, from Texas the other day that I can really, between May and October, cannot complain about the weather in Connecticut. It's it's rather sunny on a regular basis, but yeah, you just hit that December, January, February slide, and it's just gloom, gloom every day. <laughs> All right, we'll try to do better in, in lifting some spirits out there. And want to remind everyone that's in the live chat, of course, uh, this show is only possible based on your individual contributions and we're looking for a sponsor. So I will continue to keep the phone lines and the email open, Mark Rogers TV at Gmail, if you've got any contacts in that direction. Also, your comments, your questions, your debate topics, anything that you've got for us uh, for Ohio State football. But we're going to start with the arrivals and departures. And uh, since uh, Tony started... Um, it off in regards to uh, suggesting that be the topic because it means a whole lot. This is the school that uh, seems to lose as much or more than anybody else in the country. I think we've actually got one one in particular that everybody's excited about coming back. So uh, set us up here, Tony. Yeah, I think Chris Olave coming back was the big surprise of all of this. When you looked at other guys and their decisions – Maybe Tommy Togi, I surprised some people, but the biggest surprise I think was Olave. I never even considered that he would come back when I projecting the depth chart even next year. I never had Chris Olave on it. It was, it was always like, you know, is this uh, now this guy's job or that guy's job? And to see him come back with um, w- with the guys around him and the fact that Justin Fields is gone now, to me, that speaks to Olave's confidence in the guys who will be taking over, be it C.J. Stroud or Jack Miller. I'm sure he hasn't seen Kyle McCord yet, but he has confidence in in what he's been told, that whoever does take over for Justin Fields is going to be pretty good. So I think that's a good sign. I would argue that it would have been – if you're going to pick one or the other between Tommy Togia and Chris Olave, I think Tommy Togia would be the one guy you would rather have back in terms of uh, a national championship caliber team. But getting Chris Olave back is huge for a young young quarterback who is going to be, you know, getting his feet wet all season long and having a guy that you can rely on along with Garrett Wilson makes that receiving core just as dangerous as it was this year, if not more so next year as they get older and get better and get deeper. Your thoughts about uh, the, the big arrivals and departures in regards to who's staying, who's leaving, and maybe who made a mistake and who did not, Kevin? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything that Tony had said just about. I was kind of shocked about Olave as well. Oftentimes we pre-write things and we had just the version of him leaving. We never had one of him coming back just to give you an idea of where our mindset was. Um, you know, I think that's huge. I think that getting uh, Jeremy Ruckert back is a big deal, getting, you know, uh, Tyreek Smith back, uh, getting uh, Haskell Garrett in terms of somebody taking advantage of that extra year of eligibility, especially with the loss of, of Tommy Togiai. I think having Haskell Garrett, somebody who really went through the full gambit of everything from the off-field incident to just having just this huge season and then coming back for one more year, you know, I think that when you look at what Ohio State loses, it certainly loses a lot, but You know, all things considered, you know, we see what's happening at a program down in Knoxville with their entire team going into the portal. We see what's happening with the team up north. We're seeing what's happening at other places. Ohio State certainly, I think, was able to ride the defection uh, train a lot better than most other programs. 
Yeah, I'll throw in. Um, I was surprised that Togi I left. I talked to one of the NFL draft gurus uh, here in the last couple of days, and he said he thought Togi I was a fourth or fifth round pick. Uh, it was noted that he may be the strongest player on the Ohio State team, and that he'll test pretty well. He's a solid citizen, so maybe he moves up to the third round. Uh, this guy didn't think there were a strong group of defensive tackles this year, so it made sense uh, from that aspect for him to go. I would say late second, third round for him, which still is is kind of late for a guy leaving school a year early. He's only there three years, but uh, decided he was ready to go. And uh, really, he was a difference maker, I thought, for them on the defensive line, and they're going to have to fill that spot. Uh, it's great, obviously, to have Haskell Garrett back, uh, Tyreek Smith back, Zach Harrison obviously going into his junior year, and they really need to see some of those other guys on the defensive line step up. Uh, Jerron Cage got to start against uh, Alabama, I almost think by default, since Togi I or nobody else was available. And uh, he's a guy you've been kind of waiting for him to kind of step in and, and make a jump. And so you want to see that. And then at the end position, you've got Tyler Friday. You've got Javante Jean Baptiste, uh, a whole host of guys there that uh, you're just kind of waiting on them uh, to step up and be heard from. So uh, maybe this is a year that uh, maybe one of the incoming freshmen will get a really good look. Uh, like uh, Jack Sawyer at defensive end or uh, Hall, uh, the big uh, defensive tackle from up the Cleveland area. Maybe he would come in and get a look there as well. So, yeah, a lot of interesting stuff going on with the comings and goings. But I agree having Chris Olave back, to me, that is a uh, 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 a gold star, I think, for what uh, he – thinks Ohio State will have a quarterback uh, this coming year. Olave wants to move up to the top 15 in the draft. He'd probably only be a second-round pick right now if he had come out, and uh, he's got every chance now to move up a little bit uh, with a big senior year at Ohio State. So uh, exciting times, uh, you know, guys coming and going, and, and you just wish the guys like Togi I and, and Justin Fields and Trey Sermon uh, – Let's see, Wyatt Davis, Josh Myers, Sean Wade, all those guys, the best of luck as they move on to the uh, NFL. I think a, a sneaky guy in there is also Antoine Jackson announcing his return, his sixth year at Iowa State to help with the departure of Tommy Togi. So I should probably mention that one as well. Just to, him and Jerron Cage kind of taking over that nose tackle spot. Will it? Will they be good enough? And uh, I think Cage has played okay this season, but as Steve said, we've been waiting – kind of forever on him and similarly with Antoine Jackson. So I, I think maybe, maybe a young guy can move in there and help, or maybe, you know, do they move to Ron Vincent or Haskell Garrett to nose guard and play the other guy, Vincent or, or Garrett at the, uh, at the three techniques. So there'll be some, I think there's going to be some movement, but at least they have more bodies. I mean, imagine if they had lost Jackson, Togiai and, and Haskell Garrett, they would be, um, in bad shape right now up front. We've got our first question in, but before we hit that, uh, Kevin's got some news off the NFL wire. Well, basically, you just I'm always on Twitter, and I just saw that Adam Schefter reported that uh, Dwayne Haskins and the Pittsburgh Steelers have agreed to a one-year deal. Uh, allegedly, he'd met with the Carolina Panthers as well, but the Pittsburgh situation seemed better. He'd met with the coaches, and they extended the deal. So now he will have an opportunity to learn under Ben Roethlisberger and in the Mike Tomlin system. And any system, in my opinion, is better than what he was dealing with with the Washington football team. They need to get Terry McLaurin over to Pittsburgh, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Terry McLaurin's had a great start to his career. Yeah, no question. I, I like this for the Steelers. Um, you know, it's up in the air whether or not uh, Ben Roethlisberger's coming back. They've got Mason Rudolph who filled in at times. Uh, really, all of last season he had to fill in. And um, now you uh, you bring Haskins in there as kind of a, a no-risk situation. i got to figure the contract term is very favorable for Pittsburgh. Um, I'm not sure if Washington's still on the hook to pay him for some or all of what they might owe him for next year or whatever, but um, not sure how that all works in the NFL. But um, 
I think that Haskins learned a very valuable lesson in Washington that we wear caps and sleeves at this level. And, uh, you know, we dot the I's, we cross the T's, and that means being the first guy in, the last guy out, and no off-the-field crap. And uh, I put a thing on Twitter when I saw that, that he needs to go and attach himself to Cam Hayward, who's been a pro's pro for the Steelers for a full decade and an Ohio State guy through and through, and just follow his lead and get advice from him on where he should live and, and how to how to assimilate the Steelers' culture and, and what uh, – uh, Coach Tomlin and, and uh, the the general manager and everybody everybody there wants, and uh, he'd do a lot worse than to have Cam Hayward as his mentor. So um, I think uh, the potential is there. That job's going to be open either this year or next year. Can't imagine Ben hanging on for too much longer. Um, you know, given you know his body's been battered and beaten from side to side, but. Uh, uh, great opportunity, I think, there on a, on what's usually a playoff team, obviously. Steve, you said it about as succinctly as possible. Cam Hayward has been, yes, exactly, just what you just said, a pro's pro on and off the field. He's had a great career with the Pittsburgh Steelers. He's been a yep. stalwart with that organization. They love him. I mean, they, they couldn't be happier. I mean, he had a couple years where maybe he wasn't as productive, but and he'd been through some injuries, but – his last three or four years, he was one of the best defensive uh, interior defensive linemen in the league. So, um, you know, I look at it, and, and again, uh, he's just a solid citizen. I, I think he just signed a new contract uh, for another couple of years. So he's going to be there, you know, for, to get, you know, if, if we figure this is Haskins going to be there a few years to get him perhaps help get him started in Pittsburgh. But uh, he, uh, if he's smart, he would make take full advantage of this opportunity with Pittsburgh because uh, you know you look at Cardale Jones. He had one, I don't know, he was with Bills and the Chargers, and I don't know if he was ever in with anybody else. But um, you know he's not in the league anymore, and they kind of have a similar skill set: big arm, and uh, you know some question marks beside that. Big frame, big arm, and uh, you know. You you got to earn the money now, so that's uh, he's he's kind of on an uphill battle right now to to earn a spot. Our overlap of Cleveland Browns, Ohio State Buckeye fans won't want to hear this, but if you're talking about a stable organization outside of New England, and of course that was based on two individuals in particular, and Robert Kraft, it's in Pittsburgh. You know, my son asked me a few years ago. He said. Is there a team in the NFL? Because I was talking about the constant change and saying five years ago, these teams were really good and competing for championships. Now these teams are are really bad. And he said, is, is there anybody that's been good just all the time? And I said, the Pittsburgh Steelers, ever since Chuck Noll took over yeah. by his second or third season, they, they've had maybe two consecutive marginal seasons a couple times, the Noll to Cower transition a couple times, you know, a six and 10, eight and eight, and then they're boom, they're back at it. And going on another ten or fifteen year run, they've yeah. they've been consistently good for forever. I've watched them year after year. They uh, they beat the brains out of the Cleveland Browns nearly every year, and uh, that was very cathartic. Uh, we were in Miami. We went down to the Clevelander Hotel. It was socially distanced. It was masks. We were watching on the big screen down there in Miami when we were in. Uh, South Florida for the championship game and have to say a whole group of about 300 people in this outdoor patio were uh, pretty excited watching the Cleveland Browns dismantle the Pittsburgh Steelers in that playoff game. And, and um, you know, Pittsburgh, it seemed like they were flying the white flag there, you know, at, at some point. And it's kind of like what uh, was it Judd Nelson said in uh, Breakfast Club, not even close, but not even close. Uh, Hopefully those beatings will continue for years to come. Yes, the Browns dismantled the Steelers, and the Steelers dismantled the Steelers from the very first snap of the game. Yes, loved it. All right, as Steve has mentioned here in the live chat, uh, send your questions right now, and we'll get to the first one. And Tony and Steve, beware. You're going to be bludgeoned here in a second. Bam, okay. So so keep in mind when you leave the, the, the comments in the chat, I don't want you to limit your comments, but at the same time, we've got a space uh, issue here. But anyway, Vinay, uh, Tony's buddy, spoke with Tony briefly on this. Uh, curious to get everyone on the panel's thoughts. Do you believe 
Josh Proctor should be moved to Sam linebacker and then put in Lathan Ransom at the single high safety. He already has my thoughts. You guys can go ahead. Um, you know, I love all these theories that come up on the internet and uh, all these ideas that people come up with. And, and some of them are good ideas and some of them, you know, you just say, well, in theory, that that sounds like it makes sense. But in practicality, it may not. And I, I don't know. We don't get to watch the guys practice. So other than watching the eight games that they played this past year, you really don't have a firm grasp of what all these guys can really do. And I know that Ohio State's defense was exposed at various points, and especially by Alabama, a few points in that game. They took them to the woodshed. So um, I don't know. I, uh, I think they got to go back to the drawing board and figure out, Again, I mean, they're a pretty good run-stopping defense, but uh, you know, that's that's just one small part of, of winning football games. And I think um, Ryan Day is going to put some uh, onus on uh, on Kerry Combs and, and, and Greg Madison if he's still there and Larry Johnson if he's still there and, and Washington and, and uh, Matt Barnes to, to give me some solutions. Give me some ideas. Give me some options. Uh, give me some personnel groupings. Give me some people who can do different things, and and just just show me what what we can do to get back to basics. And I think they'll be much better defensively in twenty twenty one. And some of it's just guys getting older and being another year older and deeper in the system. And you know, again, some of it is you're going to have to experiment and uh, kind of step outside your comfort zone if you're Kerry Combs and figure out, you know, the experiment, figure out what's going to work and what doesn't. Because obviously whatever they trotted out there personnel-wise or scheme-wise against Alabama didn't begin to be good enough. I mean, there were other teams that played Alabama better defensively throughout the course of the season, nearly everybody else they played, almost to a team. So, um Again, Ohio State's got a lot of issues on that side of the football, but the good news is hopefully they'll have spring football. Hopefully they'll have uh, summer workouts, and it'll be a normal offseason. And and you have, other than your linebacker group where you're starting over, you've got veteran guys on, on the defensive line, probably four or five guys with starting experience. And in the secondary, three or four guys with starting experience who can uh, kind of lead the rest of them. In terms of your one specific question, yeah, if Proctor can – be a great run port player and he's their best option to be that third linebacker, then sure. Why not? But I, I just don't know that that's necessarily the case. And uh, you know, you move him there. It's kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul. It's kind of like leaves you a little thin in the secondary and you may be taking time away from somebody in the linebacker group who could really help you. So I'm open to suggestion on that. I don't know if there are any words left to say. I mean, <laughs> Steve hit everything there. I mean, we haven't seen anything. I I don't know if Josh Proctor is the right answer at, at linebacker. I mean, who you, the goal is to get the best 11 guys out there, but you can't put if, – if your best 11 guys are corners, you can't – you know, that doesn't work. You've got to fit the jigsaw puzzle together. You know, we saw some good things out of Lathan Ransom. I think he's going to be really good as time goes on, but – uh you know, you have the lab of, of spring football and everything else, and hopefully the lab is open and you have the opportunity to, to try some things out. But honestly, you know, on, you know, this is the first time I've heard this, you know, this question. I'm, I'm not privy the way Tony is to getting these inside questions. But uh, with that being said, I, I guess I've never really thought about sliding Proctor down to a, a linebacker position. Honestly, you know, you got to find a way to get your best guys out there. But I don't, I don't know based on what, it is that I do know or what I think I know. I don't, I don't know if, if Proctor is the best uh, guy to put it, Sam. I'll just throw in, I think it'll be good next year from a defensive standpoint if you have guys that are healthy, like uh, Cameron Brown, who was going to help out the secondary. Uh, Court Williams is a young guy who they were talking about after a first few days that they really liked him, uh, and then he got injured. Um I'm sure I'm missing some other guys, but uh, uh, Ronnie Hickman will probably finally be completely healthy as well. We saw him at times a little bit. 
So you got uh, three or four guys that are, quote, veteran players, but they haven't played a lot of football. And I think those are guys that are going to help the bottom line if they're healthy this coming season. So I'm excited uh, to see how in the spring they're able to mold it together and uh, kind of, you know, show some new and different wrinkles and and uh, utilize the depth that they should have at each of these position groups going forward. Kevin, I know I think you guys have the, the snap counts. I'm not even sure Marcus Hooker played defense the last three games because he was banged up. And so that's another guy. That's another one right there, yeah. And, right. Uh, they didn't have – the forced them to play so much 4-4 against Alabama. And you, you bring him back and uh, even just – not even specifically him, just other bodies. Because you're looking at a, a secondary next year with Marcus Hooker and Marcus Williamson both returning. I think they might like to replace both of those guys with younger guys. And you, you could replace Marcus Williamson with Cameron Brown, who was there before Marcus Williamson. And then Cameron Brown gets hurt in the slot. And so then there's Marcus Williamson, who eventually then had to move out of the slot because it, it didn't go very well for him, move more to a, a safety. There's just – like we saw so many different things from the defense this year that I don't know how to apply it all to what we will see next year, because you'd think next year they would have more solid answers that would allow them to be uh, more static in what they do. It's, it's either one high or it's too high and they just go back and forth. Whereas this time, you know, we, I mean, we saw too high, one high, we've seen uh, you know, nickel safety with a nickel cor corner and all of these different slot things. And, um, and, and I don't know that any of it was necessarily – there's no bullet that we were so high on in 2019 that we never got to see because Pete Warner didn't – they didn't need it because they had Pete Warner. This coming year, it's unfortunate this spring that Court Williams probably won't be good to go since he had his injury in uh, like October. And so I, I don't know that he'll be good to go. So you won't be able to see what he could do. To me, I wonder if they're going to go to more of a 4 2 5 like a, a true four-two-five, where you've got a, a nickel linebacker like a Court Williams or even like a Josh Proctor, similar to what you know Indiana does, and, and you just play nickel all the time because they are still good at stopping the run. You would think that you know would would changing out one linebacker for a two hundred and ten pound safety really make that much of a difference? Yeah, they're going to just need some of these young guys to to step up, especially. In terms of corner, I mean, I'm I'm looking at a guy like Jacalyn Johnson coming in. You know, could could he come in and immediately kind of upset things and get himself right into the mix? Maybe be your slot corner at that point. Uh, you know, they they uh, as as Tony had put it, there are a couple of guys that probably need to prove it big time over the spring because you know it was a rough 2020 for them, and uh, an opportunity really only knocks once and. You know, if, if a young guy is able to come in and is able to do it cleaner and better, I mean, you know, the, the, it's about playing for now. And, uh, you know, somebody like a Ja'Kalen Johnson, I think, really could could step right in and uh, press some guys. I agree. You had Alabama starting a freshman, I think, at that, sl that slot position uh, this year. I mean, Notre Dame had an outside corner freshman starting. So, like, just because you have a freshman starting doesn't mean it's the uh, – it's doom and gloom, especially with some of the guys they're bringing in in this uh, this 2021 class. And I, I think um, you've got to you've got to do something. And maybe Cam Brown moves outside, and like you said, Kevin J.K. Johnson, Jaquelin Johnson goes in that slot, and it's maybe a little bit easier for him. But uh, the the key the key is they just have so many more options. And the guys that they were afraid to play this year, like Ryan Watts and Legend Cavazos, are healthy and maybe more trusted. And then you know Ronnie Hickman is a year healthier. Uh, Bryson Shaw, all of these guys are just a year older, and they've had so many injuries, and you would hope that that would not be the case moving forward, and then they could just, you know, just try and figure out what works and uh, see what starts happening in the spring here in about, I don't know, five and a half, six weeks, maybe. Evan is certainly the recruiting guy here, so he might be able to come up with a name for me, but North Carolina had a cornerback playing this year who was supposed to be playing high school football uh, but he was one of the two or three top cornerbacks in the nation coming out of high school, and they actually threw him out there for the entire season. He was supposed uh, – I don't know what the conditions were in his situation, kind of like maybe a JT Daniels where he left school early. Uh, but he was supposed to be on the high school football field this year, and he was playing for North Carolina and starting at corner. Ohio State really wanted him. 
Right, they did. I'm trying to. I'm pulling it up because I think I know the name, but I want. I don't want to screw yeah, it up. up with them. Dre Bly Jr. No, <laughs> there you go. Tony Grimes. Yeah. Yes, Tony Grimes. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, we're seeing. I mean, we're used to seeing the reclassification in terms of basketball. Hell, Michi Johnson for Ohio State basketball, but we don't see a lot of the reclassification in terms of football and. And yeah, I think that that was one of the big things that uh, got uh, a Virginia kid to go to UNC. I mean, obviously proximity wasn't that bad, but he knew he was probably going to have a really good chance of seeing some legitimate playing time. And yeah, he he saw all the playing time. I was getting myself reacquainted with Lathan Ransom because I got to say, I don't remember much about his recruitment. Uh, 11th rated safety, according to the composite, number 167 player in the country. And he was rated higher until he committed. And then 24-7 and rivals just dropped him like a rock, like always happens with those recruiting sites. Yeah, those stupid recruiting sites, the way they do their uh, recruiting rankings, um, <clears throat> it is kind of the way of the world, I guess. Once you commit, you're, you're dead to me. You know, type <laughs> of thing. But um, Ransom, I think there was a lot of buzz that he could come in and help them, and then obviously they they lost some guys in the secondary, as we've outlined, and the need was there, and we saw him play. He was in the national championship game even, uh, I think, on a, on a few plays. So uh, those experiences that those guys, the young guys that did get to play, even in small dollops like the wide receivers Fleming and uh, Smith the Jigba, and even G. Scott, uh, those will uh, really go a long way, I think, for those guys going forward. Paris Johnson as well played some key times in different games. So I think, uh, you know, it wasn't a lot, and it wasn't like it normally would be, but I think it was better than the alternative, which was nothing. So I think when you think about it in those terms, it was actually uh, a pretty good uh Pretty good uh, a turn for Ohio State, the young guys this year. I know the question on the on the screen is about the quarterbacks. Unfortunately, we never saw any of them throw a pass, which is, uh, I mean. No excuse, Steve. You need to answer the question. And you guys, a uh, warning here, you're going to have to come up with about, let's see, eight months to the season, about 35 different versions, because we're going to have to talk about this every week. I'll put a different spin on it. So David Knight, our Notre Dame fan, huge supporter of the channel, asked his question, just leaving it out there. Who's going to start next fall? We discussed it last week. I'll add this to it as well. When was the last time, we'll start with Steve, when was the last time there was a quarterback competition this wide open? Just. Well, you know, Joe Burrow and uh, Dwayne Haskins in 27, was it 2018, I guess, uh, they came out of the spring, and Meyer would not commit to Burrow that he was going to be the starting quarterback, I guess, and that was the all he needed to know to say, okay, I'm graduating, going on to LSU, and made history there in 18 Not to cut you off, Steve, but of course, Dwayne Haskins came in against Michigan and threw one of the best passes you're going to see in a clutch situation down by yeah. six in the third quarter. So we, we saw Dwayne Haskins, but in terms it's of – It's kind of hard to go away from him, yeah. Just yeah. guys like – we don't know I what don't they can do. The last, we just know that they're supposed to be really good. Yeah, in the last 20 years, maybe Justin Zwick and Troy Smith and how Trestle tried to juggle that in 04 and 05 and, you know, before finally committing full throttle to Troy Smith in the middle of the 2004 season. Um, you know, I, I don't know. It, it, it's been rare that Ohio State's had a battle like this, and I'm sure Ryan Day is going to be dogged by questions on it. I'm sure he's not going to answer it until maybe the Monday before the – or the, I guess it would be the Friday before the Thursday game at uh, Minnesota to open the season if uh, even then he decides to address it. Maybe he just – like what he did with Rod Gerald and Arch Leister, pull them both aside and shove them both in. And you're like, whoa, whoa, what is that? You know, so I don't know. But um, uh, I do believe it, it. the two freshmen this year have the upper hand on the court because they've been through a full, at least a full fall season rotation. They didn't even get much of a spring last year. So how much of an advantage it is, I don't know. But they've had a season in the system, at least, whereas McCord is starting from scratch uh, upon his arrival. I think the freshmen are due to arrive on Saturday. And uh, Ohio State, for the first two weeks of the semester, did uh, 
online classes only. And now on Monday, there will be a mixture of in-person and online classes, I think, for the rest of this semester. So uh, I think it made sense to hold off on bringing people to campus until absolutely necessary. And I think uh, guys will be moving in this weekend. Uh, the freshmen, I would assume the upperclassmen, got to go home after the national championship game. If you weren't from Central Ohio, you could probably go home to wherever you were from and conduct your online classes from there. And uh, I assume the winter program will either start this week, this Monday, or in the days ahead with Mickey Marotti and uh, Coach Day talked about how the guys needed some time to recharge their batteries and see their families and, and these kind of things. But uh, it's going to be right back uh, to the grind, you know, before they know it. So, Tony, uh, something tells me that Ryan Day is going to show a little bit more wisdom than John Sir, uh, John Cooper. Chew, I'll spit it out here at some point. John Cooper, that would be circa 1996-97 with uh, Jermaine and uh, Jackson with these quarterbacks. Yeah, I, I think so. There's no sense in putting anybody ahead of anybody else in this until – the the availability report usually comes out on the Friday before the game. I wouldn't be surprised if the availability report next year comes out on the Friday after the Thursday game, and and that's how you know where you stand. Uh, it's there, there's no uh, no reason to encourage somebody to leave, and I don't think Kyle McCord would anyway. Regardless, I, I think you know he's coming in to win the starting job, but he he's not just going to leave if, if somebody else wins it. But you don't want to. There, there's no reason to start making declarations right now about who is where. And I'm, I'm thinking back to you asking past quarterback battles and the 2018, I don't think there was almost, there's almost nothing Joe Burrow could do to prove himself more than Dwayne Haskins did in Michigan in 2017. So that was, that was a hard one for him to win. Just like there was nothing JT Barrett could do in 2015 to prove that he could win a national championship in camp like Cardale Jones won in the, the previous winter, and that's why Cardale Jones was the starter, even though JT always moved the ball better. But they had that – Urban Meyer had that proof that Cardale can win a national championship. Then you go back before that to, you know, Zwick and, and Troy Smith where I don't know how much of a fair shake Troy got in that one. And so this is completely – yeah, this is almost like starting over starting a new offense with, with these guys. And um, I'm, I'm interested to uh, gosh, I almost said, I'm interested to see it. We're not going to see it. I'm interested to hear about it, but we're really not going to hear much about it other than everybody looks good. So I don't, I honestly don't know what we're going to get out of it this spring, Mark. I hate to, I hate to burst the bubble here, but uh, you know, maybe, maybe we can beg and plead like, Hey, can you guys just practice in the shoe for us? That way we can sit up and see deck and, and just watch and, you know, we'll, we'll wear our masks. We'll we'll do whatever hazmat suits if you want. It would just be like nice to have our own information based on what we see. And of course, whenever we go to a practice, the quarterbacks are always as far away as possible on all of these practice fields. But still, uh, we would know to bring binoculars, uh, although they may be confiscated. <laughs> yeah, just back to the to the Haskins and Burrow situation. I had. Sources indicate to me that there, it wasn't really a competition at that point. They'd already kind of told some people people that barring all hell breaking loose, it was going to be Dwayne Haskins just based on what he had done at the Michigan game and, and, and everything else. And it was just too smooth, the, the transition out that Burrow was able to make. So I, I'm, I'm going to ride with what my sources said on that. And then to kind of get with what Tony has said, and 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 Steve to a to a degree as well, we don't get to see these guys practice. We we might get an opportunity. They might send us four plays on a, on a, like a clip reel or something like that, to where they all throw the same identical pass. We don't see. We just see their motion, and we don't see if it's completed or anything of that nature. So, I mean, it's it's going to be a long seven plus months handicapping a quarterback position where. If we don't have a spring game and we don't have some things of that nature, we've not seen any of them throw a collegiate pass. I mean, obviously, it's impossible for McCord as an incoming freshman, and then we've only seen Miller and Stroud as a runner. So, you know, we can sit there and we can break down what they've done in terms of high school tape and things of that nature, but it doesn't necessarily translate well. And, yes, Stroud and Miller are going to have a little bit of a leg up being in the system for a year, but 
Ryan Day has also showed that today is the most important thing. And if the way that we've seen that we saw Justin Fields go well into a fourth quarter leads me to believe that the backup quarterbacks were seeing 10% of the snaps, maybe in practice with the ones. So I don't know. I mean, maybe outside of just knowing the playbook to a certain extent and knowing the, the, the wording of plays and things of that nature. I don't, I don't think it's an insurmountable lead that either of the, the guys that were here last year have over Kyle McCord. That being said, Mark, my over under four touchdown passes for CJ Stroud next year is 35 and a half. So and feel free to place it's, your wagers. It's going to be a bit difficult for him to reach that number in garbage time. So I think I know where you're leaning. Okay. Samson Simpson, let me do the honors here. My apologies here. Uh, I don't know who any of these dudes are talking, but pretty good stuff here. Yes, it's pretty good stuff. This is 89 consecutive weeks, Samson, that we've done this Ohio State Buckeyes talk. And I would I would be a little bit biased here to say that this is the best Ohio State video or audio podcast out there, albeit these gentlemen are involved in other ventures. And of course, they do a tremendous job on their own sites and their own podcasts. But Let's this is the best of the best right here. Best of the best. We pull them all together. Your dream shot. I'm sending you to, uh, what, what is it he says in Top Gun? You're getting your dream shot. I'm sending you to whatever. Miramar. This much you're going to be flying a, a cargo plane full of rubber, rubber dog blank out of Hong Kong. You yes. tell me about the movie. Time. <laughs> That's we the first time the movie all day. That's a movie line. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we got Kevin Noon right next to me from Rivals, Buckeye Grove. Kevin Noon, Buckeye Grove on Rivals. So there you go, Samson. We got uh, below Kevin is Tony Gerdeman from Buckeye Scoop. Quite a venture there. Great content as well. And, of course, uh, Steve Hellwagon right below me from Buckeye Bucknuts. Bucknuts on 247 Sports. And Steve has been gracious enough to post these um, audio podcasts, video podcasts, I should say. I'll get these things straight today. Uh, it's the, it's, it's always the first one. Uh, anyway, uh, on, uh, of course, uh, 247 sports buck nuts. So that's it. See cotton 99. He's asking about Travion Henderson and what his possible opportunities could be in 21, Steve. Well, I think the sky's the limit. I mean, he's going to be the highest rated running back that Ohio state has on its roster, at least coming out of high school even if he doesn't have the uh, the experience that uh, guys like uh, Master Teague and uh, even Mayan Williams, Steel Chambers, and Marcus Crowley have all at least taken a few uh, handoffs. While Teague, you know, obviously was a mainstay for uh, this season and, and all of last season as well, the backup to J.K. Dobbins. So uh, he's got some ground he's got to make up, but if Tony Alford wants to get the best guys with the highest ceiling on the field, uh, there's no reason why Travion Henderson and Evan Pryor wouldn't uh, get a, a strong look this spring. And, and obviously going into the fall, uh, we saw what it means to this offense to have a dynamic running back last year with J.K. Dobbins. And then obviously uh, with what Trey Sermon was able to do, breaking tackles and carrying people along with him against Northwestern and Clemson, I'm not sure Travion Henderson – is that kind of a back, though? I've got him listed at uh, 5'11", 195, which would uh, – uh, Trey Sermon, you know, eclipsed that when he was in the 10th grade in high school probably. So, uh, you know, I uh, – again, I don't know how you go about uh, involving freshmen and how – what they have to show uh, to earn playing time. Obviously, ball security is a big part of it. Pass blocking is a big part of it. Understanding your responsibility is a big part of it. So, um, yeah, I think he's got tremendous upside and uh, great appeal, no question, to get him out there and see what he can do. But, uh, again, I don't know if size could prove to be a limitation for him or if they will put him in positions and situations where that size is not as big of a detriment and they, they work – uh, obviously, in, to find ways to utilize his speed. So uh, I'm interested to see what happens. I mean, number 24 overall prospect in the country and number one running back 
in the country. That kind of says it all with Travion Henderson. And then to also get uh, Evan Pryor in this class, uh, number two, I think, all-purpose back in the country. So he's also regarded up there. I think he was a top 50 guy, on at least uh, the composite. So uh, two guys, or no, rather top 80, I think, uh, uh, nationally overall in the composite. So two national top 100 players, two potential difference makers, and two guys ranked probably 100 spots higher than anybody else who's a running back on this roster, at least coming out of high school. So uh, the Buckeyes finally getting back in the blue chip running back business, uh, maybe first time since J.K. Dobbins. I'll jump in here. Um, I'm not concerned one bit about Henderson's size at all. He is – He's a guy that just goes out there and makes like, you know, PlayStation looking type of moves. Uh, you sit there and you're like, well, you know, I don't know if I like him between the tackles and he squirts right through. He's a guy you get to the outside. He just makes things happen. It'll be interesting to see, though, what the translation is maybe from a more rural Virginia setting into playing in the Big Ten. But, um, you know, I think he's somebody who's right, right in, in that mix. I think he is a he is a good change of pace from either a steel or either a Master Teague or a Mayan Williams. And and I'm not sleeping on Evan Pryor right out of uh, right out of the gate as well because he is that all purpose back as Steve had mentioned. I had an opportunity to go down and see him outside of Charlotte go through some some receiver drills basically. He and a quarterback and a couple other players were out there just going through their own drills on their own and they invited me to come out and see him and and he's a talented pass catcher as well. I think, you know, we're going we're gonna to say Evan Pryor on the wheel route several times during his career. I promise you that. But when it comes to Henderson, I think he's somebody right there that he could, he could lead to an early departure for another back on this roster right now. And I'm not going to handicap who or anything because that's not fair to anybody and we don't have spring practice to go through. But Henderson is the real deal. Uh, he's not a guy you're going to put a lot more weight on. You're going to you're going to you're going to reshape his body a little bit, get him to become you know not that 17 year old kid, but that 18 year old young man or whatnot. He's going to he'll take to Mick Marotti's, uh strength and conditioning program, but he's he's not a guy that's going to be you know playing at at, at 215 or anything like that. Yeah, in terms of uh, prior, I think. Um... What Ryan Day said on signing day, he's he's a guy that they can use in the run in the pass and, and can be used in multiple ways. I know uh, Henderson tweeted a couple of weeks ago that he was up to two ten now, so you know, he he's he seems to be preparing for life in the Big Ten. But what I see him doing is like when you watch Master Teague run, it's it's that first hole, and it's always it's just he, he's going in that direction. That's where he's going. With Henderson, I see him being more the, the sermon guy who can. No, I'm going to go to this cutback. That's where the, the hole is. And he's just, he's incredibly dynamic in terms similar to what JK, go back and watch JK's high school highlights. He was ridiculous. Same with Ezekiel Elliott, ridiculous. And then as Kevin is saying, like, well, how good is the, the, the competition? And those are the same questions I had with those two. But there, there are things they do where it doesn't matter what, you know, what, right. what competition they are because you just look at him and it's different. And he's elusive and he's fast. And I, uh, I, you know, he didn't play this year, so neither did prior. So there is going to be that. They did not have a, a senior season. Uh, I, I know I've been adamant that I don't see him starting game one, and some people have taken issue with that because they point at J.K. Dobbins. But, you know, Mike Weber was hurt, and that's why J.K. Dobbins started game one. J.K. Do Dobbins may have been starting game 12. I don't doubt that. But even as a, a sophomore, J.K. Dobbins still split carries with Mike Weber. So uh, I, I think he's good enough to start as a freshman, and you give him the ball as a freshman. I think he's going to, you know, put on you know, 15, 16, 1700 yards for you. But there, there is a pecking order that we'll see if he can get through, and and what that pecking order will be, I don't know. I think there's going to be a lot of movement at the running back position for the Buckeyes this year, and I don't want to, as Kevin said, I don't want to start uh, putting people in the portal right now or moving positions, although. I, I will say I think Steel Chambers would probably best be served to move to defense at this point. Where would he play on defense? Linebacker. He was a talented yeah. linebacker in high school. He was a two-way player. Uh, a lot of schools were recruiting him at linebacker. One of the things that set Ohio State apart was recruiting him on offense. But I said even at that point that I figured his last day at Ohio State, he'd be playing defense. 
From what we've heard from really Ohio good. State fans, they would have wanted him to switch to defense last year. <laughs> well, and when he's been in, like he's made positive yardage. It's, I, I just think there have been some fumbling issues. And right now the depth chart is going to be tough for, for anybody. I think it's going to be tough for Master Teague to hold everybody off at this point too. So again, those names were Elliot and Dobbins. Hopefully you've tracked those guys. Are they doing pretty – what are they – well, the Elliott kid didn't really only rest for like 360 yards as a freshman. I, I don't know what happened after that. <laughs> okay. All right. That's about That's what he had this Google. year with the Cowboys, wasn't it, Kevin? About 360 yards? Well, yeah. It, it's what he did in the middle. It's, the, the peak's been pretty good, I think. Cowboys don't know. I, I, I never heard of him. Really? Is that really? Is that true, Kevin? I don't think anybody calls him Elliot. I probably threw some people there. Uh, our guy Vinay, or to be more accurate, Tony Sky Vinay, uh, basically asking about the recruitment and hopefully eventual signing of JT Hui Molawau out of Washington, the state of Washington. And it 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 has seemed like a foregone conclusion that he's going to be a Buckeye, but Alabama, Oregon, USC, and others are charging hard, Kevin. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is that there are a lot of things that make sense for Ohio State's pursuit of him, but this is not a kid that's gone out and, and sought out the limelight and done a bunch of interviews or anything like that. So there's there's no game playing, but we don't know what the game is either. I mean, we don't, you know, we don't know what his thoughts are. If Washington does, in fact, lose its defensive coordinator to Texas, that's not going to all of a sudden put Texas in the in the mix, but it will – you know, it, it will help everybody else because Washington will probably lose a little bit of, of of what it had going for it. I mean, it's always going to have proximity, but losing the D.C. I think would be a pretty big hit at that point. You know, I think it's just the default mode that everybody puts everybody to Alabama or whatnot. And I certainly have heard him attached to Alabama several times or whatnot. I'm not really sure why anybody's going to SC at this point. I'm just being honest. I mean, they... They did get to the Pac-12 championship game on like a two-game season or whatnot, but uh, it's not that Clay Helton is really that secure in his job. Um, I still like Ohio State's chances. I don't care what day he announces, whether it be signing day or he you know, waits two months until after that and just signs financial paperwork instead of a national letter of intent at that point. But you know, I think things are still trending well for Ohio State's chances with him, but you know, I'm, I'm certainly not going to go out to the middle of the oval and, and declare he's 100% going to Ohio state because this is a kid that we've never truly had a great read on because he's just not been very interested in this whole process. I think if the NCAA comes out and says on like January 31st, no visits through like June, then yeah, I would expect him to sign on signing day on the second signing day, because I think he's waiting to be able to visit places and maybe that's not going to happen. And so at that point you just, you, you go with your, your number one. Or you pay for uh, you pay for the trip yourself to drive yourself around campus. Yeah, Which we're seeing that a lot right now, and you know, we'll see what kind of comes out of that one. Yeah, we're seeing that a lot. Kids are are coming in. I hope the NCAA will relent a little bit and, and at least just put in some guidelines and say, okay, you can have uh, prospects visit under these conditions and these that are safe for everybody involved because. Uh, this is ridiculous that somebody would make a college decision without the ability to visit the campus. And some of these people don't have the wherewithal to travel from coast to coast to see some of these different colleges. And, and um, I think that the process, the way it's been set up for decades needs to prevail in this case, and they need to get kids the ability to come and, and visit their colleges. So um, I mean, I get the safeguards that are involved, but no one's playing a game now for eight months. So you don't really have to worry about protecting the sanctity of the of the team or whatever. I mean, if you're personally concerned about uh, contracting COVID, just opt out of participating in the visits and uh, or take the proper safeguards with social dis distancing and masks and whatever else. Uh, hazmat suit as you guys uh, said earlier but there's no reason why in some small limited form schools can't uh, allow prospects to make on-campus visits 
I, and I hope during spring football that that'll be a possibility. And again, just come up with some very streamlined guidelines that, that they're allowed in these areas and they're not allowed in these areas. And that's just the way it is. I mean, I think that's just makes common sense. I think you don't want to risk in the student athlete currently to contract the virus because, you know, hot prospect number one from Florida comes in with his great aunt who's got COVID or whatever, or his uncle, third uncle's got COVID. But, um, you know, I think there's got to be a happy medium here somewhere. I don't know. Uh, ends up going on a visit and ends up getting COVID there. I mean, the NC2A is only worried about covering the NC2A's butt at this point. And, you know, if, if it's a, if it's an NC2A sanctioned event or whatever, they're afraid of any sort of blowback that's going to come to them. I honestly don't see anything, any sort of relief coming for this class of 21 I mean, I, I thought I read somewhere that they were dead all the way through the end of April, to be honest, but I don't know. I mean, there's so many reports that come right. in these times right. that I I don't know where the dead period is at this point, but I'm I'm not operating under any sort of belief that we're going to have anything for this class and that we're just hoping to get maybe the evaluation period in some way, shape, or form for 22 and maybe maybe even have a couple of camps if we're lucky. The Rod Farva has, I believe, about four or five questions here. I think we'll pick off the first one. Question for the guys. How does they keep all those wide receivers happy? I don't know that that's necessarily his concern, but it's more about, um, you know, using the guys in the right positions and in the right roles. Tony. I remember when Tony Alford was asked, how do you keep J.K. Dobbins and Mike Weber happy? And he's like, it's not my job to keep them happy. It's their job to keep me happy. <laughs> and this would apply here as well. And you sign all of these guys in case some of them don't pan out or some of them leave, that the ones who stick around are really good. And yet I do think they can uh, can make it work because other guys have made it work, past guys at Ohio State, where they Ohio State wants to rotate at least six uh, at wide receiver. And when they have done that, they've been very good and they've been very successful. And there is really no complaining because everybody gets their 25 to 40 catches and, you know, 400 to 600 yards. And the culture that they have created allows for this. I go back to, I don't know, it would have been 2017 maybe. Johnny Dixon already had a touchdown catch. There was in the red zone and a play was called for him. And he pulled himself out and sent Terry McLaurin in so Terry McLaurin could get a touchdown. That's the type of culture that has been created at Ohio State and that uh, that was passed down to Chris Olave. Chris Olave passing that down, Brian Hartline doing the same thing, and, and the players have to buy into it. And I believe that's just understand that's understood. They came in here knowing that it's it's deep. I mean, you had four top 100 receivers all commit, at this, all sign with the Buckeyes, and then the next year you've got a couple more, and then the next year you've got a couple more, and – they see that they can see the depth chart, and it's it's not going to be you just walk in and you catch 40, 50, 60 passes. Julian Fleming, the number one recruit in the nation, caught what you know seven or eight passes this past year, and it wasn't until late in the season where he got most of those. And uh, you just you rotate, you throw the ball more than most Big Ten teams, and you've got a quarterback that can complete them, and uh, you just deal with it. And if somebody isn't happy, then is it really a loss? Yeah, you get out there. I mean, you earn playing time. Nothing's given to you. These guys know that coming in. It's not like you can just sit there and fill these guys' heads full of just, you know, sunshine and rainbows and puppy dog farts as they're coming in and tell them that they're going to get this, that, and the other. And then if they don't produce, you can't just trot them out there because of some sort of recruiting promise. So, yeah, it, it's it's going to be it's going to be a stacked room, and that I would rather have a stacked room than a than a sparse one at this point. And you know what? If if you lose a guy or two in the process, you know it, it, it sucks, but it is what it is, and and you just go on because I can assure you this class of twenty one that's coming in is really good. I already have you know uh, guys that are are dudes in twenty two, and it's not going to stop in twenty three or twenty four. Uh, so you need to you need to be ready to open the door when you hear opportunity knocking, or you know you may get passed by. And it's just another huge advantage of being Ohio State or being on that tier with only a couple of schools. If you drop a tier or drop maybe two tiers, then you're 
fill in the blank. You're the fourth or best, fifth best team in the conference. And maybe even at places like Penn State, where if you get a high four star or a five star at a particular position, they're so much better than everybody else at the position. Yeah, they give you 80% effort. That's going to be good enough because they're just so talented and, and you want more out of that player, but they're still the best you got at that position. So they're going to play versus, okay, if you don't bust it, hey, we got all sorts of talent behind you. We don't need you. Yeah, we would love to see you at your best, and you'll probably play at your best, but that's not even a given. So you have to play at your best because otherwise, nope, we got four or five other guys. Yeah, I, I saw some fans reacting to Chris Olave returning, like uh, uh, afraid that people are going to transfer. And that's the wrong attitude to have when it comes to getting a guy like Chris Olave back. Just be happy and know that you know Julian Fleming is not going to leave because of uh, of Chris Olave. Jackson Smith and Jigba played plenty as a freshman with Chris Olave, and so he'll continue to play. G. Scott is still learning and is I doesn't even play the same position as Chris Olave, so there's no concern there. And Mookie Cooper already left, so I don't see there being any any negative impact from Chris Olave showing up. And if he takes a bunch of catches away from everybody else, why would they transfer after this season now that he's finally gone? No question. Great problems to have, really. And uh, the depth is there, I think, at most every position uh, to withstand one or two guys. If they got to go, they got to go. That's just the way of the matter. And uh, you replace them with better players on the other end. That's just how it's been at Ohio State for years. So, And I know better players is kind of a relative thing. But, uh, you know, Sean Wade leaves and, and – somebody else comes in the back door who was just as good as he was coming out of high school. So that's the way, uh, that's the way you keep this thing right on rolling. There was one guy that you guys uh, did not mention when talking about the running backs and that's a Mayan Williams. Uh, do, do we figure that he has a legitimate shot at staying re relevant? Yeah, I'm, I mentioned him. I said that, uh, okay. that, uh, you know, Henderson would be a good change of pace either for, Teague or, or, or Mayan Williams. So, you know, I love the way he runs. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, I don't see him as being a guy that you're going to be able to trot out there for 25 carries or anything. I mean, could be proven wrong, but uh, at least at this point, he doesn't appear to be that guy. But if he keeps holding on to the ball and the way that he runs and the way that first contact and second contact and third contact don't bring him down, it takes – it takes an army to bring that guy down. I mean, he's got just that crazy center of gravity and just that lower body. Uh, you know, I think he's somebody who's very much in the mix. Uh, again, I don't see him as any sort of feature back, but, you know, I think a lot of that too is predicated just on on the depth of the room around him. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Our Ohio State show is only possible because of these three, Tony Gerdeman, Buckeye Scoop, Kevin Noon next to me, Rivals, Buckeye Grove, and Steve Hellwagon, of course. Bucknuts 247 Sports. And if you guys have another minute, I'd like to throw this one at you that was tossed out concerning Marcus Freeman, uh, defensive coordinator at Cincinnati. If you look at the performance of the Bearcats on that side of the ball, it's been tremendous. They've led the American Conference in any major meaningful statistic on that side of the ball his two or three years. Um, and then he moves on to Notre Dame, takes over for Clark Lee, who took over the head job at Vanderbilt. So did we know Marcus Freeman had this in him, Steve? Well, I think he's a star that's been on the rise, obviously, uh, with what Luke Fickle has done at Cincinnati in just what would it be three or four short years. Uh, he's part and parcel of that success. And uh, Freeman had been at Purdue previously uh, before going to work with um, – uh, fickle at Cincinnati and as I said uh, the defense was one of the better uh, parts of that Cincinnati program the last couple of years obviously and uh, he's getting an opportunity now and you know to, to see what he can do uh, in in the big leagues you know at, at a power five school and and arguably you know one of the biggest football programs in the world at Notre Dame but uh, people ask, well, why wasn't Ohio State part of it? Well, you know, first of all, he played for Jim Trussell. He played for Luke Fickle. Luke Fickle and Ryan Day were never on the staff together at Ohio State. They just kind of saw each other in passing, I guess, going in the door. So uh, I think that uh, you say he's part of the Ohio State family, but he, Again, he wasn't even a member of Urban Meyer's Ohio State family, so uh, or Kerry Combs' Ohio State family, or anybody else. So 
uh, you know, yes, he's Ohio State and alma mater, and maybe one day he would end up at Ohio State in one fashion or another. Uh, he's one of the better people I think I've come in contact. I'd put him in the top 10% of the guys that I've interviewed over my 20-some years at Ohio State in terms of quality person and all that. We know his story and everything, but just – timing. It just didn't work out. I think, uh, I don't think he would have been somebody who was forefront in uh, Ryan Day's thinking. Ryan Day hit a home run with uh, Halfley, Jeff Halfley, who he brought in a year ago, who they'd worked together at the 49ers and uh, decided, hey, I'm going to bring him to the college level after uh, Halfley hadn't been in college football for nearly a decade. And he's been a star, obviously now the head coach at Boston College. So, um, you know, it's just kind of a timing, who you know, where you're at type thing. And, uh, yeah, he's got Ohio State behind his name, but I don't think it was a name that Ohio State's coach really thought much about. There was a word on the street was that one point there was some conversation, but it, this goes back prior to this year. And you also have to sit there and see where your, your positions fit at this point. Uh, you're, I mean, is it, would you have Marcus Freeman in a position to where he's coaching your secondary? You got a guy named, uh, you got a guy named uh, Larry Johnson working with your line. You got a guy named Al Washington working with your linebackers. So sometimes it's a matter of making the pieces fit. But um, you know, I hear people with their dissatisfaction with how some of the defense was called or whatnot at this point, and saying, "Well, you need to be able, you need to be able to do this." And I mean, there have even been rumors that maybe somebody like uh, Greg Madison may be toward the end of his his career and ready to, you know, enjoy the silver years of his life. But uh, you need to find a situation to make things fit, and it just wasn't necessarily going to fit at that point. And I understand he's the hot name, and him going to Notre Dame, and there's just this natural rivalry between Ohio State and Notre Dame for a lot of obvious reasons and whatnot. But, you know, Notre Dame, to its credit, identified him, allegedly paying him a ridiculous amount of money. Congratulations, Marcus, to that. And, you know, it just kind of is what it is. You know, I talked to um, Daryl Hazel, whatever year he was still at Purdue at Big Ten Media Days about Marcus Freeman, and he said he's a future superstar in the business. And I talked to one of his linebackers, and everything he told me about what Marcus Freeman does was exactly what every single linebacker at Ohio State ever told me about what Luke Fickle does. And there are mirror images of each other basically as coaches. And I think just with Ohio State, Basically, if I recall, like Ryan Day had already decided on his two coordinators. Marcus Freeman was already a coordinator, so now you're going to ask him to come to Ohio State, but you're not going to be a coordinator. You can maybe coach linebackers, and it's it's going to be a bit of a demotion, probably a raise. But as I think I said a few weeks ago here, I think the reason he stuck around for as long as he did is because he thought he would be the next head coach at Cincinnati. But if Luke Fickle's never going to leave – you have to go to a bigger school and be a coordinator. That way you can land a job like Cincinnati, which he now can. Maybe not Cincinnati, but who knows? Maybe Central Florida as Danny White goes to Tennessee and takes his head coach with them or something like that. But I think he had to move to be able to go to a bigger place, and then this is where you get your next big job. Yeah. Speaking of next big jobs, Jordan Kapler, appreciate the Super Chat contribution. Looking at uh, one of the four of us, I guess. He's throwing me in the, the mix well, to uh, to uh, replace. Mark, Jeremy only Pruitt. one of us on the show has a Tennessee helmet in the background. So Yes, let's uh, not cover that up with this ugly So uh, I had a McDonald's a couple of days ago. Oh, I have some cash laying around. Maybe we're all capable of co coaching. Tennessee. Hey. I don't have a lot of cash, so that would strike me out there. So if they want to pay me six million dollars, I'd go down there and act like the head coach at Tennessee for a year. Can't do any worse than the people they've been paying to do it. You can do it uh, for free. Yeah, Tennessee, I mean, they won the first BCS national championship in ninety-eight or whatever. And like since then, um, you know, they've kind of fallen off the college football map. I can't even remember a remarkable moment for them in the last 20 years other than getting boat raced every year by Alabama, Florida, and whoever else. So Georgia, Florida, Georgia, and Alabama, you know, have have boat raced them. I mean, I, what would you think the combined wins, Florida, Georgia, and Alabama for Tennessee? Is it maybe six or seven? I'm glad you asked uh, that, Steve. 
I, I heard this the other day. Games, 60 they, total games in 20 years. Have they won seven or eight of them? So so they haven't beaten Alabama since Nick Saban showed up 13, 14 years ago. Uh, they are three and 30 against those three in the last, what, 11 years. Yeah, three and 30. So, you know, you're, and again, it's not like Tennessee's a very fertile ground. There, there are some high school football players there, but you have to go to Georgia, Florida, the Mid Atlantic. I mean, you got great states all around you that, uh, and they've done, they did good in the past coming up to Ohio and getting a, a top 10 Ohio guy every now and then too. But it just, there's just nothing there that would draw you there, I don't think. I mean, it just, they, they let it die. It, it really, Florida State, Michigan, Tennessee, Virginia Tech, they should all get a room. They've, the people, the caretakers of those programs, in the last 5, 10, 15 years, have let all, all three or four of those programs pretty much die out. And it's unfortunate. Uh, you know, they're Tennessee in name only. That's all they are right now, just as Michigan's Michigan in name only right now. So um, I don't know. Florida State's Florida State on, in name only. So um, I don't know. It's sad, sad, but oh well. No, they should be recruiting a lot better. Nashville is one of the hottest emerging recruiting markets out there right now just because of population shifts. And when you look at the kids at the uh, private schools, at the Montgomery Bell Academy and, and Brentwood Academy and places like that, you sit there and you see Alabama and UGA and Ohio State and a lot of schools fighting for those kids, Michigan even. So, you know, I don't think that there's, you know, the, the area of uh, eastern Tennessee may not be producing the talent. And western Tennessee, once you get closer to Memphis, is more of a basketball-centric area. But they're still putting out talent. But they should be doing so much better in Nashville. And I, I know I know Vanderbilt's there. And Steve and I both know Barton Simmons very well, who left the recruiting industry to kind of become their Mark Pantone, if you will. But... Tennessee should be in a lot better shape based on recruiting there. They're only two and a half hours away from, from North Georgia, which means they're only about four hours away from Atlanta. Uh, you know, it, it has just been inept leadership around that Tennessee program. And, you know, the, the thought is with them bringing in uh, Danny White from UCF that maybe they'll be able to, to write some things, but they're going to have to go through and clean up a lot of culture issues, I think, as well, because – uh, it's it's a mess there right now. It is an absolute mess, and whoever the new coach is is going to be paying for the sins of uh, not only the, the outgoing coach but maybe some previous regimes as well because it has been a lawless, lawless venue for a long time. There's a lot to clean up, but there are a lot of resources and there's a lot of advantage that you outlined. To It, it can be done. It, you need a strong guy that has a plan, that knows his stuff and can come in. It can be done. It With a seven-year deal. Big Vol Daddy. All right. I'm believing this is going to be a mic drop moment. My balls <laughs> suck apples for sure, but if the program is... Put on the death penalty tomorrow. They will die undefeated against the Buckeyes. Good day, fellas. <laughs> there it is. Have a good show, everybody. Talk to you later. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I got nothing else. All right, everyone. Appreciate it. Uh, you guys are the best. Uh, Tony Gerdeman, Buckeye Scoop down in the corner. Uh, Steve Hillwagon right below me. Bucknuts 247 Sports. And, of course, Kevin Noon, Buckeye Grove Rivals. You guys, again, thank you so much for all that you do. Hope everybody out there appreciates it. And we will see you next week. Take care.